Ephesians chapter 5. Last week, um, Paul reminded us, as we're going through the book of Ephesians, Paul reminded us last week that we are to walk, obviously, as children of light. We're to live in such a way that people see Jesus Christ through our lives each and every day. And he used that in an illustration there last week that we need to stop hitting the snooze button. We need to stop living as if it's not a big deal to live for Christ. And sometimes we snooze and we're just not really thinking about the fact that we're supposed to be living for Christ everywhere we go. And he warns us we can't live that way. We always have to live in such a way that people see Jesus Christ through our lives. So we're going to be in verses 15 through 21 this morning, Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. We've been looking at God's plan for our lives, and, and here he says it's God's plan to control you. I don't know about you, but I don't really like when other people control me. We, we don't like it when people say, you have to do it this way, and we, they put us in a box. And, and yet when it comes to God, he says, listen, what I want you to do is I want you to yield over full control of your life to me. And he tells us if we do that, life will turn out much better than if we try to we try to control it and ask God to come along for a ride with us. And yet we we struggle doing that. So this morning, that's the concept, God's plan to control you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. Thank you for your love and your compassion and your grace. Thank you for what you did on Calvary. The fact that three days later you rose from the grave to demonstrate and to prove that you are the God of all gods, that you have conquered sin, death, the grave, hell, and you offer us salvation, you offer us a relationship with you by grace through faith alone. So we thank you for what you've done for us. We trust that we would do our best to allow you to control our lives even today. In Jesus' name. We, we understand, if you've, if you've ever watched, um, I think it's called Kitchen Impossible or something like that. You know Robert Irvine, who will come to, to restaurants that are just really struggling. They're not doing so well. And they make a call, they make a play like, hey, you're the expert on this. Can you come and help us? And I've not seen a lot of them, but I've seen a few of them where he comes and he says, all right, this is what we need to do. And he takes their menu and he says, we got to get rid of this, got rid of this, get rid of this. We need to redecorate this whole place. We need to change this. We need to change the attitude of the staff. We need... And it doesn't go too long where the owner says, oh, whoa, 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 time out, time out, time out. That was my dear old grandma's recipe. We're not getting rid of that one. And he said, it's horrible. You're not using that one anymore. He's like, no, 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 no. And so there's this battle. Where the expert comes in and says, listen, we need to do it my way. And the owner's like, I want to do it your way and my way. And he's like, it's not going to work. He's like, either you are going to give me full control and you'll have a good product at the end or I'm going to walk out. And, and the whole, it's, a, it's a whole scene, a whole scenario. And at the end of the show, the big reveal and everybody's eating, and they're like, this is finally good stuff. We're coming back again. And the, the owner of the restaurant is like, he was right. I, I'm glad I let him have control of my restaurant. And that's the whole thing seen here. When Jesus Christ says to me, listen, Ron, I want you to yield full control of me to the Holy Spirit of God. We struggle with that. But every child of God that has ever done that, on their deathbed, they never say this, man, I wish I hadn't done that. Every single one says this, that's the way to live. That's the way to live. And so here, Paul says this to us as God's children, his fellow Christians in this walk with God. In verse number 15, he says this, see then that you walk circumspectly not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. 
So in verses 15 to 17, he says, we need to have hearts that are principled. That we live based upon the principles of what God's word teaches us in the scriptures. And he says this, I want you to work, walk circumspectly. Not a word we use much today anymore. We don't tell people to walk circumspectly. It literally means to walk precisely or accurately. Interesting, it's the Greek word akrobos. This doesn't mean a whole lot to us. But I found out this week, there is a watch company called Acrobos. And you know what their focus is? We have watches that are precise and accurate. I thought that was good. And I found out you can get a pretty reasonable one for $325. I'm like, what in the world? And then I found out that's a budget watch. I'm like... Who buys watches like that expensive? It's crazy. I don't ever buy it. I don't like watches. But some people, they collect watches. You only have two arms. How many watches do you need? But again, the focus is this watch is what you need because it's precise and accurate. Now, we have a, we have a really nice large wall clock that we bought at a yard show one time. It's beautiful. We love it. The only problem with it, it doesn't tell good time. Put a new battery in this morning, set the clock, and it's, it was correct. But by Wednesday, nobody's going to want to use that clock to tell time with. Now it's pretty, and it was cheap. And the only problem with it is it doesn't tell time. And if we wanted it only to tell time, we'd get rid of it. But it does more than that. It's, it's decorative, right? It looks nice. But as a child of God, he tells me that my job is to not just look nice in this world. My job is to walk precisely. My job is to walk accurately, according to the word of God. So that when people see me, when people watch my life, they are noticing what a Christian is supposed to be. A Christian is supposed to act like, a Christian is supposed to talk like, think like. And he reminds us there that we are to walk circumspectly. And then he says this, not as fools, but as wise. So he says you need to walk accurately. Secondly, you need to walk wisely, not as a fool. Now what's a fool? Well, the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So God says a fool is a person who lives as if there is no God. Now let me tell you something. God doesn't believe in atheists. He tells us that there's no such thing as an atheist. Now there's a lot of people who claim I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. Why? Because they don't want to live like there is a God. They don't want to live as if one day I stand before a holy God and he's going to judge my life. So I'll just pretend I will just close my eyes to the truth that there is a God and I will declare myself to be an atheist. But God says that that really doesn't work. But people live that way. And we, we've all watched in our world today, people are living as if there's no God, as if there is no eternal life, as if there is no judgment. But one day they will find a root awakening. Right? They all know deep down, Romans 1 reminds us deep down they know there's a God. They know, they, know they, they will give account to that God one day. But they, they suppress it. They don't want to listen to it. They don't want to believe it. So they live as if there is no God watching them. Now, if you're a child of God, you can't ever become an atheist, right? We know there is a God. But Paul says, listen, Christian, don't live like you're an atheist. Like, what? I can't live like I'm an atheist. I knew there's a God. But listen, do we ever live? Do we ever act? Do we ever do things as if? There's not a God watching me. That's what he means by this. He says, live accurately, but second, live wisely, not as a fool. Now, have you ever, not you, have, have you ever heard somebody, another Christian, say something like this? Yeah, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not doing that. We, we know Christians that have done that, right? They're all, they're all at another church today. We've all done that, haven't we? Yeah, I know I'm supposed to. I, I probably shouldn't say this, but. And what's God saying? 
you're living like you're a fool. I want you to live wisely. If we know that God wouldn't approve of it, don't do it. Don't say it. Don't think it. We, and we struggle. We read earlier, Paul, things I want to do, I don't do. <laughs> things I don't do, I find myself doing. We struggle. The old man, it's, we wrestle in there. And so how do we get victory? Well, we have to go back to, you know what, God, I'm going to let you have control of my thoughts, my mind, my heart, every part of me. See then, he says, that you walk circumspectly, carefully, accurately, precisely, not as fools, but as wise. And then he says this, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Live effectively. Redeem the time. Buy back the time. It's just like when Jesus Christ, he redeemed us. We sing that song from time to time, redeemed how I love to proclaim. It means that we were sinners and God paid for us. He bought us out of the slave market of sin. He paid and bought us back. He took advantage of the fact that he had the ability to redeem us from sin. What a great truth. But God says, I need to redeem the time. I need to make Make the best of every opportunity I have to live in such a way that I'm living accurately, I'm living wisely, I'm living in such a way that people are seeing Christ through me, looking for opportunities to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Had a good opportunity yesterday, the day before, uh, to, to you know, start a conversation. I'm like, this is, this is going well. And so we're talking, and, and, and all of a sudden I find out she's already a believer. And I'm like, that's horrible but that's great that's but i wanted to share the gospel but sometimes we're like we we've got to redeem the time right but we've got to look for ways and realize that god has a plan for us to talk to people about jesus christ buy those opportunities why the days are evil you know romans 12 12 says this that the devil's wrath has come down upon us why because he knows that his time is short does it, does it seem like evil is ramping up more and more? Why? Because Satan knows the time is short. Satan has read the Bible. Satan knows this book better than we do. And you know what? He's read the book of Revelation. And you know what he's found out? He will be banished forever and ever in torment. And he knows the time is getting short. And he's ramping up every effort that he can to destroy mankind. He's pernicious. He knows that's his end. But he wants to take as many people with him as he can. And he wants to corrupt us in the church. And he wants to do everything he can to, to mess up God's plan. Now, God will be exalted. You read the book of Revelation. In the end, God wins. Right? And the child of God gets to live with him forever and ever. That's a great truth. But till then, what's God say? We need to live in such a way that we live circumspectly. We live precisely carefully accurately we need to live wisely we need to live effectively and so god's encouraging us to do this but then he says in verse number 18 to 21 he says this not only should we have a heart that is principled that we live according to the word of god the principles that god gives us in his word but he says this i want you to live with a heart that is pliable wherefore I'm sorry, verse 18. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of of God. So a heart that is pliable, what does he mean by that? Well, he says, he wants my heart, my inner man, who I am. He wants it to be yielded, submissive, given over to God. And he, and he used the illustration of be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Now, again, we have a hard time taking the scriptures and saying that in no time ever should anybody ever have any type of alcohol, period, end of story, right? We know 
that in Bible times, people often would use wine and, 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 and some kind of alcoholic drink because there oftentimes the water was bad and it would kill the germs. And we understand that, you know, we know it's not the wisest thing to do. But in, in biblical times, there was exceptions where God would say, listen, you can't be drunk. So we understand that people did drink some small type of alcoholic drinks. Again, somebody's sick, somebody's dying, give them some of that. When there were ailments, they would do that. And we even take different drugs today that, 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 that are, they, they do some bad things, but they do good things at the same time. But here's what God does tell us. When we, when we try to compare biblical wine, what was going on in the New Testament days, to what we have on the market today, it's not apples and apples. It's not even close to apples and apples. Some have said that in order to get drunk in that day, you'd have to almost drink a gallon of wine. It's not today. Okay? Today, one beer, you're getting pretty close to that level. Um, one glass of wine, you're probably over the level, right, of what it means, because there's more alcoholic content in a glass of wine than there is in a, even in a can of beer. But again, we kind of, as our modern day world, we're like, oh, it's okay, do whatever you want to do, right? Here's what we do know. Noah and Lot both got drunk and fully regretted what they did. They had no intention to get drunk. It wasn't their plan. Their plan was to just drink a little bit. I can handle it. I won't get drunk. They did. Almost destroyed their lives. Why? Because drinking's not in the category of wise, right? It's not a wise choice. It's not a wise decision. Now, some people can handle it. I can drink and I have never ever been drunk because that's the command. God says don't ever get drunk. That's a sin. We know that. That's clear, right? But we can't go so far as it's very impossible to ever say to somebody, the Bible condemns all drinking, period. Right? But we can say, if you ever drink, it's not wise. It's not in the wise category. What did God say? Be wise, right? Just be careful with it, right? He, but that's not the point. The point is not alcohol. That's not the point of this message. That's not the point of this verse. He threw it out there because we all know that's, well, that's true. God says, don't be drunk. Many, many verses in the scripture talk about strong drink. And only a fool would drink strong drink, right? What we have on the market today as light stuff is probably in the category of strong drink in the New Testament times. But that's not the point. That's not, I just want to share that because... I want to get that off my chest. But what's he say here? Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but here's what he wanted to tell us. Be filled, be controlled, be drunk with is almost what he's saying. When somebody is drunk with alcohol, they say things that they would never say when they're sober. They do things they would never do when they're sober. They act in certain ways that they would never do when they're sober, right? Why? Because the alcohol is talking. God says this. We know that's wrong, right? Be not drunk with wine. We cover it in other places in Scripture. But he says this. It's a perfect picture. It's a perfect analogy of what happens when a child of God lets the Holy Spirit have control of your life. Be not drunk with wine, but be controlled by or be filled with the Spirit of God. I think it was last year. might have been the year before. My daughter got me these gloves. I love these gloves. They work really, really well. You know, sometimes you get gloves and they're just too big to work in the yard. And some are just so small, you pick a rose and it bites you. It's just horrible. These were like perfect. You know, and I've had two pairs just like this, and they've been really, really good. These are so good that sometimes, because I love to do yard work, but sometimes you just, I don't have much time. Sometimes I'll pull the lawnmower out, and I'll start it, and then I'll put these gloves on it, 
and I'll say, I'll be back later. And I come back a couple hours later, and the yard is done, right? They're so, you're like, you're crazy. You know, these gloves are only good if somebody has their hand in them. And so, too, my life is only profitable if the Holy Spirit has his hand inside of me, guiding me, controlling me, using me, moving me. Because if Ron Whitehead is living without the control of the Spirit of God, oh, I can do good things in this world. But I can't do anything, as Woodrow Crowe would always say, you can't do anything that is of any lasting value unless the Holy Spirit is inside of you motivating you. Now it's interesting, we're, we're never commanded to, to stay saved, right? We're not commanded to be regenerated. When we get saved, it's once and for all. Regeneration, the spiritual baptism, right? Uh, we're not commanded to do a lot of things. It's a one-time act. But you know what God does say? Verse number 18, be not drunk with wine, where is excess? But I'm commanding you to be filled. And it's written in the present tense, which means continually be filled. You know why? Because when the Holy Spirit controls me, I'm in fellowship with God. I'm able to do things that are pleasing to him. But when I sing, you know what happens? I lose the control of the Spirit of God. I'm not losing my salvation. <laughs> Can't lose my salvation but I can lose his control of my life where now I control it. I, I govern it. We said before, you know, aren't you thankful there's only one steering wheel? Because if you had two steering wheels or imagine four steering wheels of your car and whoever's in the back and who's in the front gets to decide, you guess your car is going to go all over the place, right? That's why there's only one steering wheel. And, and the Holy Spirit should be holding the steering wheel of my life. And when I reach over and grab it, the Holy Spirit does this. And he says, you probably shouldn't do this. You should probably let me control it. And when I surrender and I say, okay, he'll put his hands back on, but only as I take mine off. Because he understands that if, that if I'm trying to control it, he has no control. And he gives me the, the willingness, the right to either direct my life according to his plan or do it my way. And I know that his way is always what is best. But I often grab the steering wheel. Because I sometimes think, but you know what, God, if I just did it. And every time I grab it, he lets his hands off. So he warns us, he reminds us, he encourages us, don't be drunk with wine. We know what that looks like. We know what somebody who's drunk looks like. Like you can't talk to them, you can't reason with them, you can't, because they're not in their right mind right now. Same thing. When I'm not under the control of the Spirit of God, I'm going to do things my way. I'm not going to listen to wise counsel. I'm going to I'm going to be bent on no. This is how it's going to be done. But when I'm under the control of the Spirit, you can reason with that type of person through the Scriptures. And look at the end result, verse 19. What happens to that person? Well, they, they speak to themselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. They give thanks always for all things unto God and the Father of the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, they submit one another, themselves to one another in the fear of God. So a Christian who's filled with the Spirit of God, we... We, we continue to praise God, right? We continue to worship and glorify him. We're thankful people. Have you noticed this world is not thankful anymore? Why is that? Because there's a rejection of God. There's a, I'm God. I, I get to decide. But, but Christians who are under the control and the influence of the spirit of God, they're Christians who are joyful. They're Christians who are thankful. They're kind. But then he says this, there are also Christians that are submissive to one another. Now, now we get to the marriage relationship later, next week, verses 22 and following, where it talks about the relationship of the husband and wife. 
But verse 21 isn't talking about that. Verse 21 says this, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submission is a military term. It simply means to arrange yourself under, to place yourself under the authority of somebody else. It doesn't mean, if you were in the military, it doesn't mean that if you were an enlisted person, it doesn't mean that your commanding officer was smarter than you. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It doesn't mean that they were a better person than you. It doesn't mean a lot of stuff. What it does mean is somebody had to be in charge. And it wasn't you, so you were under the authority of somebody else, right? You can work your way up the rank sometimes, and maybe you're over somebody else. But regardless, it, it doesn't mean you're better or smarter, or wiser, or whatever it may be, but it simply means that there's an order. And God says this, you and I need to learn how to submit to one another in the fear of God. Well, what does that look like practically? I think one of the greatest ways that we see what this looks like is remember who Jesus was. He's the God of all creation. He's the one who created the world, right? I mean, Mises and Colossians 1, he was the author of creation, but yet he came to earth. He humbled himself. Why did he do that? Well, because I couldn't be saved any other way except for God becoming a man dying for my sins, and rising in the third day. And so God tells us in Philippians, he humbled himself. And he submitted himself to becoming a human being. And that's a beautiful example, but he went even further than that. In, in the scriptures we're told, before he died, gathers the disciples together, as they're all gathered together, it's customary to wash feet. Jesus is the God who created the world. And one of those guys should have washed his feet. But he did this. He got up, took his outer robe off, girded himself with a towel, got a wash basin, and went around and he submitted himself to one another. And he washed the disciples' feet. That's a perfect picture of submission. He didn't have to do that. But he submitted himself under these guys who were all going to flee in just a matter of hours. And Peter was going to claim, I don't even know him. After he just said, you can't wash my feet because I know who you are. And Jesus washed his feet. It was an act of submitting himself to others. And then when he was all done, he said, guys, do you know what I just did? Like, you just washed our feet? He said, no. I just served you. And that's what I want my people to do for other people. I want you to be a servant. I want you to live and, and realize that there are people in this world that you're going to bump into. Sometimes they're unkind people and ungodly people. And you know what? I want you to serve them. I want you to go out of your way to show them what submission looks like. Don't get caught up in positions and power and who you are. Submit. Serve one another in the fear of God. And the more and more we let God do that in our lives, the more we understand what Christianity is all about. He's, he's taken our heart and he's helping it to become pliable. He's letting the Holy Spirit come inside of us and control us. And when we start doing that, we find ourselves doing things that we wouldn't normally have done. And you're like, well, I don't know where that came from. Just like the drunk person who, who acts unusually crazy and the family's like, we've never seen him act that way before. 
Right? It's like, well, where did that come from? It's the alcohol talk. And that's sad. But so too, you and I have all faced it. When we have done things that are pleasing to God, when the Holy Spirit is controlling us, sometimes we find ourselves doing things and we're like, you know what, you wouldn't have caught me dead doing that 10 years ago. And I don't know where it came from, but it seemed like the Holy Spirit was telling me to do that. And it's an act of mercy, and it's an act of kindness. Look at the Good Samaritan. Remember when he came along, and others should have stopped and helped, and he comes along and ministers, cares, gives money. If you need more, I'll come back. I'll give you more. It's like, that guy should never have done it. But the principle is his heart was pliable. He lived by principles. I'm supposed to do what is right. And God wants to do the same thing in my life. So think of this just like when Robert Irvine goes into a restaurant and they fight and they bicker and they complain. You can't do it that way. You can't get rid of those chairs. Those chairs are important to me. That picture can't go. But we've had that picture since we opened this place. He's like, it's trash. You get it out. Again, when they go back in, and they see the difference. And now they see a crowd and people paying money to eat their food again. It's like, you know what? We had a rough start, but I'm so glad I submitted control to Robert Irvine because look what he's done. That's just a small picture of what God can do in my life when I say to him, God, I know I fight you. I know I'm not... I'm not always submissive to you, but you know what? I want to fully yield my heart to you. Do in me, do with me, through me, whatever you want to do. I'm going to stop fighting you, and I'm going to let you have control of me. I'm going to do what you tell me to do in the Word of God. I'm going to be principled. I'm going to follow the Bible. I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight and argue with it. I'm going to follow what the Bible says with my life. And I want you to control me. I guarantee this. I can't guarantee much, but I can guarantee this. If you do that, and if God gives you some sane moments before you die on your deathbed, I can guarantee you this. You will not look back with regret. You will look back and say, I'm so thankful that I let God control my life.